I stayed at Prison Fellowship for 12 years. Um, I was given other responsibilities in addition to Justice Fellowship, which was the lobbying piece. Um, and actually other people took over the day-to-day -day operations and I was getting consumed by other responsibilities. And I realized that um, I wanted to stay involved in the restorative justice movement and I wanted to be thinking about what did it mean trying to, and I, what I was really interested in was jurisprudential language related to restorative justice. Um, how can we explain this in terms um, that are meaningful? And so I decided to leave. I figured um, the people who get paid to think and write about stuff are law professors. They have to teach as well, of course, but um, that's what I wanted to be. I'd like to be a law professor, and I'd gotten my uh, JD from DePaul, decided I would go to Georgetown um, and get an LLM, freshen up my resume, um, and then look for work. I did that and uh, spent a great year studying legal history and comparative law, uh, which were very interesting and illuminating, and once again told me that what we do here is not there because it's ordained, or because it's the only thing to do, or necessarily the right thing to do, but because that's what we're in the habit of doing. That there are other systems and other approaches that are being used um, that we would just have to travel and visit um, and see. Um, this was in uh, 1992 uh, when I left. I, I taught for a year as an, as an uh, uh, adjunct faculty member or a visiting faculty member at um, Detroit Mercy Law School. Love the name, Mercy Law School. Uh, it was Detroit Mercy. It was a combination of two um, schools. And um, so I taught there for a while, and then I went to on a project that was related to Prison Fellowship International, which works with prison fellowships in other countries, not just, there's one here in the U.S., but, and it's the biggest, it was the first, but there are 113 of them around the world. And one in Malta had been talking to the government about needing to change um, their prison, which had about 250 people in it. Uh, it's a very small island community, and uh, very close-knit, very homogeneous, and um, so we went, we made it, I, I was selected by Prison Fellowship International, I was teaching in Detroit at the time, but I went and um, with a group of other people, we spent a week there and wrote up a report recommending that they adopt restorative justice as a guiding principle and, and embark on reforms. And the Minister of Justice said that's what he wanted to do, or Home Affairs, who was responsible for that, said he wanted to do that. He wanted two people to come over and help. One was a person who could help them run their prison. And um, one of the people on our committee had been Jim Rowland, who had been the head of the Department of Corrections in California, had also been a probation officer, uh, was very much interested in restorative justice. He's the one that came up with the idea of a victim impact statement. Um, so he, they, he wanted him to come over and help um, just figure out how to run the prison. They didn't have management. They, they, was run by pr uh, police officers on punishment duty, basically. They were there for two months, and then they left. So every problem was solved by putting it off for at least two months. Um, and then there was a new batch of people to come in to deal with the problem. So it was, it was interesting to see somebody who'd run uh, the biggest state's justice system sitting in a little prison writing manuals and regulations and things. He also wanted somebody, the, the minister wanted somebody to come over who could deal with legal issues if they came up. Basically, he wanted to rewrite their prison regulations. Um, and uh, so he asked me to come over and teach at the University of Malta. I ended up not doing a whole lot. We, we did rewrite the prison regulations, um, but they didn't need any legal help. So it, it was a wonderful experience for us, and, and I did teach. Um, but when I came back, expecting to, to teach law, um, instead, um, through a combination of experiences, um, went to work for Prison Fellowship International with the task of setting up a justice reform arm that would promote um, work with our affiliates that were encountering justice problems, in particular restorative justice. So I hadn't gone to law school, but I had gone, I mean, I have now found myself in a situation where once again I'm responsible for helping develop and articulate and work in the area of restorative justice, but to do it not kind of from the academic setting, um, but by intervening in a whole bunch of different legal systems and, and that sort of thing. So that's what I do at this stage. One of the early things that we did um, was start a website. While I was in Malta, the Internet World Wide Web started. Um, and I was actually sending email messages to people, um, and it was amazing what you could do. I mean, I had thought fax was wonderful, and now there was email. And when I came back, 
um, um, Netscape had started, and so there was actually a, a nice little browser that you could work in, and you could send email that way. And, um, and Microsoft had set up their Outlook system, and I mean their Office uh, structure. So all of a sudden, we were able to connect, and one of the things that was beginning was people opening up pages on the World Wide Web. And the name RestorativeJustice.org was untaken, so we got the domain name and put up essentially a long paper about restorative justice that you had to, we used hyperlinks, but it, it took you all over. Um, but one of the uh, volunteers from Prison Fellowship contacted us a couple years later. He worked in web design. He was in Australia. And he said, you know, congratulations on getting the name, but I think it could be a much better site. Um, would, you know, I'd be happy to work with you on this. And uh, he did a lot of work for nothing and then a little bit of work for very little um, and put together, it helped us put together a really nice site. So we began investing in it. It looked nice. People were starting to use it, visiting it. And um, so we began collecting, um, uh, actually we took a bibliography that Paul McCold had developed as part of a UN project. Um, he had done an annotated bibliography on books and papers on restorative justice and had maybe 150 or 200 listings in it. So we took that and created a database and then began adding to that and have continued to do that. Now we have over 9,000 um, entries on that. I mean, it's amazing what you can do if you just do it persistently. Um, but the idea is to try to have as much uh, available to people that they can get, link it to online resources if they're available, uh, at least have the bibliographic information um, so that people can track it down. Um, and so it's begun, it's kind of developed on its own. We have a tension, of course, organizationally in that we're an association and our job is to help our affiliates. Um, and there's a lot of information on Restorative Justice Online, which is restorativejustice.org. People want to look it up. Uh, there's a lot of information that we can use in helping our affiliates. Um, but we also have to be working with our affiliates on the particular issues that they deal with. And so there's always a tension between how much time do we put into this, how much time do we put into uh, work with our affiliates. And, there are times when that's really hard. I'd like to be working more on something related to a debate that's going on in restorative justice community, but I need to actually be doing something real. Um, and what I always find is that doing something real informs my perspective in ways that I would never have, have thought. Um, and so I consider myself really fortunate. I mean, it's sort of the best of all possible worlds to be compelled to respond to people who are looking at prisoners and victims and the problems that they're facing and who are wanting to respond to those problems and to help them to do it uh, along the lines at least of improving conditions, uh, if not um, moving it in a restorative direction. And then at the same time to be able to observe and to read and to kind of stay current in the debate within the restorative justice field and try to analyze that and understand it and, and, and make it available to people in, uh, in some way on our website. Um, you know, it's just a great job. And uh, in fact, I explained it to somebody once who said they pay you to do that. And I said, that's a third good thing about this uh, position. So, um, so I feel like I've been very fortunate. I got in on something at the ground level and uh, it wasn't something that I came up with. It was something that other people were coming up with. But we were able to do our bit uh, in that and in doing it, it just, it leads you. What I, what I find as I work on restorative justice is um, it compels you to do a couple of things. One is to understand that justice is about relationships um, at, at all levels. Um, it's the relationship of an individual to another individual, a, an individual to a community, an individual to the state structures that, that person is involved in. But there's a relational dimension to all of that. Um, it, it can't be done in, in the impartial way that we want it to be done. And to, and to achieve full justice, at least. We, we lose something when we depersonalize it. Um, 